Hello again, everyone, and welcome to Scripture Verse by Verse. Today we begin a new book of the Bible. We're in the book of Nehemiah. So we will begin in Nehemiah chapter 1, verse 1 in just a minute. While you're getting your Bible, I can remind you that the Scripture Verse by Verse website can be found at thebibleversebyverse.com and that you can study the Bible from Genesis through Revelation, an in-depth, verse-by-verse Bible study going through the entire Bible from Genesis through Revelation, verse-by-verse. Verse. Now, this is, this is a Bible college education, and it truly is because it's all Bible. And you can go through the Bible, three complete series, listening to my audio Bible messages 30 plus years of archives for you at the Bible verse by verse dot com. So check it out and let me know if it if it blesses you. I appreciate hearing from you. That's at the Bible verse by verse dot com. And Father, today we begin the book of Nehemiah and we ask that you would bless it, that you would sanctify us by your truth. Your word is truth. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, Nehemiah was a contemporary of Ezra, and uh, the theme of this book is the rebuilding of Jerusalem's walls. When Ezra brought a group of people back from uh, exile after 70 years of being out of the land as punishment for God, they came back and they started building the temple. And uh, Nehemiah it will bring back some people or he will come back and the issue here is rebuilding Jerusalem's walls. The author is Nehemiah. The date of writing is, as I said, contemporary with Ezra, about 5th century BC. So we begin in chapter 1 verse 1, the words of Nehemiah, the son of Hakaliah, and it came to pass in the month Chisle, in the 20th year, as I was in Shushan, the palace. So just to set the context for you, years earlier, Babylon conquered Israel. And, uh, and that's because God let it happen. Babylon, they were terrible people. But God allowed them to conquer Israel because Israel had fallen into the grossest sin and refused to repent. Well, anyway, they're in exile in Babylon, and after that, the Persians conquered Babylon. And the Persians let the Israelites return home. And some returned, and some did not. This was after they had been in captivity for 70 years. Some returned, some did not. Nehemiah was a Jew, an important servant of the king of Persia. So he had not returned with the first couple of groups. So, as I said, he was an important servant of the king of Persia. And with that, we look at verse 2. And Hanani, one of my brethren, came, he and certain men of Judah, and I asked them concerning the Jews who had escaped, who were left of the captivity, and concerning Jerusalem. So Nehemiah wanted to know how the Jews who had returned home back to Israel were doing. Verse 3. And they said unto me, The remnant who are left of the captivity there in the province are in great affliction and reproach. The wall of Jerusalem also is broken down, and its gates are burned with fire. In short, the Jews back home are not doing very well at all. Neighboring countries are giving them a hard time. Not only that, the walls of Jerusalem which Babylon destroyed, are still a mess. Verse 4, And it came to pass, when I heard these words, that I sat down and wept and mourned certain days and fasted and prayed before the God of heaven. Sometimes people don't eat when they're sad. Sometimes God's people don't eat as a prayer to God. And both seem to be true for Nehemiah right here. Verse 5, And I said, I beseech thee, O Lord God of heaven, the great and awe-inspiring God, who keepeth covenant and mercy for them, who love him and observe his commandments, 
God's people tremble before you, and yet you are merciful, and you keep your promises to your people. Good way to start out this prayer. He praises God for his faithfulness and his kindness. Verse 6, Let thine ear now be attentive and thine eyes open, that thou mayest hear the prayer of thy servant, which I pray before thee now, day and night for the children of Israel thy servants, and confess the sins of the children of Israel, which we have sinned against thee. Both I and my father's house have sinned. He confesses his sin and the sins of his people. But he also asks God if he would carefully listen to what he has to say in this prayer of his. 7. We have dealt very corruptly against thee, and have not kept the commandments, nor the statutes, nor the ordinances, which thou commandest thy servant Moses. So he starts out with confession, which is a pretty good way to start any prayer, I would say. Because until your sins are completely confessed, God's not going to hear your prayers. And so he confesses that Israel hasn't been doing things the, the right way. They haven't treated God correctly. They haven't treated mankind right either. And that only makes sense because if, listen, if, if somebody doesn't respect God, how in the world can you trust them to respect you? If they are not trustworthy toward their creator, how are you going to trust them and why should you trust them to be trustworthy towards you? Their creator? Their judge? The one who holds their very life and their immortal soul in his hands and they don't respect him? What makes you think that they're going to respect you. They won't. Not when push comes to shove. Oh, there might be occasions where a person is decent enough to do that, but I wouldn't bank on it. And here you have Israel. They haven't been good to God, and of course they haven't been good to their fellow man either, and, and Nehemiah confesses it before God. And then he says in verse 8, he continues, Remember, I beseech thee the word that thou commandest thy servant Moses, saying, If ye transgress, I will scatter you abroad among the peoples. God warned Israel shortly after he rescued them from Egypt. And even before he gave them the promised land, he warned them that if they rebelled, if they sinned against him and refused to repent, then he would scatter them among the nations. And God is a God of his word. So that's exactly what he did. Verse 9, But if he turn unto me, this is still Nehemiah reminding God of what he said all those years ago, but if he return unto me and keep my commandments and do them, Though there were of you cast out unto the uttermost part of the heaven, yet will I gather them from there and will bring them to the place that I have chosen to set thy name. So God also promised that if they sinned, but if they truly repented and proved it by their obedience, then he would bring them back home again. God, God's not in the business of wanting to send people to hell. He takes no pleasure, the Bible says, in the death of the wicked. The Bible says that punishment is his strange work. He doesn't want to do it. He wants to forgive, but his justice will not allow it unless people repent. And so Nehemiah is suggesting to God in this prayer that they have repented but they have turned to him because God also promised that if they would repent, he would bring them back home. 10. Now these are thy servants and thy people whom thou hast redeemed by thy great power and by thy strong hand. He reminds God about how he saved them from Egypt in the first place and from many other trials along the way. 
over the years. And then he says this in verse 11, O Lord, I beseech thee, let now thine ear be attentive to the prayer of thy servant and to the prayer of thy servants who delight to fear thy name. And prosper, I pray thee, thy servant this day, and grant him mercy in the sight of this man. For I was the king's cupbearer. Nehemiah was going to ask for a leave of absence from the king. And he is praying that the king will say yes. Always remember that God is God. And that he can move the hearts of people to do what he wants them to do. If it is his will. And so pray. If you need to have somebody's heart changed, somebody's mind changed, then pray that God will do it. He may not, he may not give you what you want because he won't violate a person's free will, but I believe he'll do everything short of that to try to get the person to cry uncle and cave in and do God's will. Chapter 2, and it came to pass in the month Nisan and the 20th year of Artaxerxes the king that wine was before him and I took up the wine and gave it unto the king. Now I had not been sad in his presence. It wasn't a good idea to be sad in the presence of a king back in those days. But Nehemiah couldn't hide his feelings. Two, wherefore the king said unto me, Why is thy countenance sad, seeing thou art not sick? This is nothing else but sorrow of heart. Then I was very much afraid. Well, like I said, it wasn't a good idea to be sad in the presence of a king. And why, the king says, are you sad? Well, it's because Proverbs 15, 13 says, A glad heart makes a happy face, but a broken heart crushes the spirit. Even a spiritual person will have a sad, troubled look if they're torn apart on the inside. Never, ever go up to a Christian. You're a Christian? Never, ever go up to a Christian and say, You should be happy. Why do you look so sad? You shouldn't be sad. You should be happy. The joy of the Lord is our strength. And right about then, I'd like to break a chair over their head. Maybe it would knock some sense into them. Or throw a bucket of ice water on their head. That is the most cruel, insensitive thing that you can do. Cheer up. Don't tell a Christian to cheer up. You have no idea what's, what they're going through. You don't know if something horrible just happened to their loved one or they just got some terrible news. You don't know that. Who are you to tell Christians to cheer up? The Bible says we are to laugh with those who laugh and weep with those who weep, not tell the people who are weeping or sad to cheer up. How silly and stupid and superficial can you get? And so, his countenance was a mess. He, had, he, he was sad. His spirit was broken. He was torn apart on the inside. Notice verse 3. And said unto the king, let the king live forever. Why should not my countenance be sad when the city, the place of my father's sepulchres, lieth waste and its gates are consumed with fire? His country's a mess. That's why he's sad. There'd be something wrong with him if he wasn't sad. It's a cold-hearted person who isn't sad when things are bad for others that they care about. Well, they wouldn't care about them if they wouldn't be sad. Verse 4, Then the king said unto me, 
For what dost thou make request? So I prayed to the God of heaven. And Nehemiah prayed silently to God. I mean, it was a quick prayer, but God read his mind, and God will answer. Five. And I said unto the king, If it please the king, and if thy servant hath found favor in thy sight, that thou wouldest send me unto Judah, unto the city of my father's sepulchres, that I may build it. Nehemiah asked for a transfer. He's not interested in going to Israel for a visit. He wants to go there to work. There's a lot of work that needs to be done. And he wants to go there to work. Verse 6, look at what it says. And the king said unto me, the queen also sitting by him, For how long shall thy journey be? And when wilt thou return? So it pleased the king to send me, and I set him a time. The king knew a good man when he saw one. And as a result, he not only gave Nehemiah permission to go to Israel, he also let him set the date for his return. And he would trust them because a God-fearing man can be trusted. Eight. And a letter unto Asaph, the keeper of the king's forest, that he may give me my, may give me timber to make beams for the gates of the palace, which is near to the house, and for the wall of the city, and for the house that I shall enter into. And the king granted me according to the good hand of my God upon me. And so there you have it. The letters would prove that, that Nehemiah had not just run away from the king. And so the king wrote letters. And, of course, there wouldn't be any sense in returning to Israel if he couldn't rebuild the place. And he can't rebuild it if he doesn't have material. So he asked for it. And since it was God's will, the king granted him what he needed, a letter, ensuring that there would be people back home who, by order of the king, would give him what he needed. Verse 9. Then I came to the governors beyond the river and gave them the king's letters. Now the king had set captains of the army and horsemen with me. Nehemiah gladly accepted whatever help and protection the king provided. And as we have seen in the past, God often will work through people to bless his people. And that's what's going on here. Verse 10. When San Balat, the Horonite, and Tobiah, the servant, the Ammonite, heard of it, it grieved them exceedingly that there had come a man to seek the welfare of the children of Israel. It's good to remember that being in God's will doesn't mean everyone will recognize it or agree with it or care about it. San Balat and Tobiah didn't agree with what Nehemiah was doing. It was God's will. But lots of times when we are in the middle of doing God's will, there's opposition, there's trouble. You think Satan's going to sit back and roll over and play dead and just let you do God's will without opposing you in any way? He sends all sorts of opposition against God's people who are walking in the will of God. That's why Jesus said, in this world, you will have tribulation. So now look at verse 11. So I came to Jerusalem and was there three days. And I arose in the night, I and some few men with me. Neither told I any man what my God had put in my heart to do at Jerusalem. Neither was there any beast with me except the beast that I rode upon. In other words, what God told Nehemiah to do, go home and rebuild the walls, was between him and God. He didn't have to come to Jerusalem and announce it, hold a press conference. It was between him and God. And sometimes it is best to keep things that God wants you to do privately. Keep it private between you and God. 
Keeping it between us and God can sometimes lessen opposition. And you don't have to deal with well-meaning people who don't understand either. Or Christians who will try to discourage you from doing it. I'll never forget. You know, I never spoke in public at all. I got saved when I was 26. Shortly after that, I felt like God was calling me to teach the Word of God. I had no experience teaching or speaking in public at all. But I, I couldn't get away from the fact that I felt like I was being called by God. So I used to walk. I still do sometimes. But I used to walk and pray. That's what I did for exercise. I walked and I prayed and I walked and I prayed. And I walked and I prayed for two solid years every single day for two years that if God would call me to teach and preach his word, if he was calling me to do that, that he would confirm it in ways I won't get into. Two years I prayed. I don't rush into things. I'll pray for things a long, long time. So I prayed for two years, that same thing. And God confirmed it. And after a little while, I started Scripture Verse by Verse Radio. I prayed about that. And I asked that God would lead me to the right station. Back in those days, there was no internet. I went to the library and I got a list of the radio stations in Wisconsin. Whole long list of them. And I prayed over them. I said, God, show me the right one. So I found one. I just picked it at random after praying. Drove the uh, 70, 80 miles, whatever it was, to another town to where this radio station was. Met with the manager. Told him that I had a program called Scripture Verse by Verse. And do you know that that man gave me free airtime? 15 minutes of airtime every single Sunday for a year, a year's worth of airtime to teach the Word. I found out that that was a, a rare thing, but God led me. So I was going to a church, of course, claiming to be Bible-believing, you know, all this other foolishness that so many people People say they believe, but really don't. Pastor come up to me and said, Mike, I don't think you should be teaching the Bible. You know, we've, we've got enough people who teach the Bible already. We've, and this is what he said. We got Chuck Swindoll and Charles Stanley. So evidently, since we have Chuck Swindoll and Charles Stanley, we don't need anybody else. You don't need another Bible teaching program. Why don't you do a, a discussion group? Well, you see, this is the in thing, you know, the discussion groups where people sit around a round table and giggle. Well, I knew what God had called me to do. He was discouraging me from doing what I knew God wanted me to do. Uh, he was such a lukewarm, moral reprobate anyway that I found out later. But I didn't listen to him. 30 plus years later, I'm still doing it. But you can expect when you're doing God's will, don't, don't expect that there won't be any people who will oppose you or try to discourage you. And sometimes it's the strangest people. The people that you would never believe in a million years would be doing that. So, here you go. This is what Nehemiah was experiencing. Opposition. Discouragement. And I'll tell you, he kept it to himself. He will experience that, I should say. But right now, he's keeping it to himself to minimize that. Because you know, a lot of people, and even so-called God's people, don't understand sometimes. Or they're not walking with the Lord like they should be. So, let's look at 13. And I went out by night by the gate of the valley 
even before the jackal's well, and to the dung gate, and viewed the walls of Jerusalem, which were broken down, and its gates were consumed with fire. It was a mess. He checked out several areas that needed repairs. And uh, it was devastating. He checked out several areas, probably to know how much material would be needed to do those repairs in verse 14. Then I went on to the gate of the fountain and to the king's pool, but there was no place for the beast that was under me to pass. The city was a mess. It seems like it looked as if a tornado had gone through the area. 15. Then went I up in the night by the brook and viewed the wall and turned back and entered by the gate of the valley and so returned. He spent the better part of the night inspecting the wall of Jerusalem, but he returned home before the sunrise, I suppose to keep his plans a secret. 16. And the rulers knew not where I went or what I did, neither had I as yet told it to the Jews, nor to the priests, nor to the nobles, nor to the rulers, nor to the rest who did the work. It was disgraceful how this place looked. And Nehemiah kept his plan secret from everyone, including the rulers. He didn't want to say anything until he understood himself, everything that had to be done. Verse 17, Then said I unto them, Ye see the distress that we are in, how Jerusalem lieth waste, and its gates are burned with fire. Come, and let us build up the wall of Jerusalem, that we be no more a reproach. And it was disgraceful how the city of God was in such terrible condition. God's people don't have to be fancy, but they should be well ordered in order to represent the Lord properly. Verse 18, Then I told them of the hand of my God, which was good upon me, and also the king's words that he had spoken unto me. And they said, Let us rise up and build. So they strengthened their hands for this good work. Nehemiah wanted the leaders to know that this rebuilding project wasn't just his idea. And when they understood that God was with Nehemiah, answering prayers, moving his heart to do it, but also answering prayers to let things fall into place, they were excited and they were willing to cooperate then. We have to tell people that the Word of God is the thing that's important. It's not my opinion. It's what the Word of God says. When I teach the Word of God, it, you're not accountable to me. You're accountable to God. And Nehemiah is making it clear to the leaders, look, this is God. This is his plan, not mine. And so having a heart for God, evidently, they agreed. Well, we'll help you out. But, 19, when Sanballat, the horror knight, and Tobiah, the servant, the Ammonite, and Geshem, the Arabian, heard it, they laughed us to scorn and despised us and said, what is this thing that ye do? Will ye rebel against the king? The unsaved laughed at them and also falsely accused them of rebelling against the king by rebuilding the walls. 20. Then I answered them and said unto them, the God of heaven will prosper us. Therefore, we, his servants, will arise and build. But ye have no portion, nor right, nor memorial in Jerusalem. In other words, it was none of your, it's none of your business what we're doing. Who asked you? The scoffers didn't know God. They didn't serve God. So what Nehemiah and company was doing for God was none of their business. And Nehemiah told them so. Slammed the door right in their face. It's good for Christians to be firm and use plain talk. Not enough of that. Well, you can continue studying the Word of God if you want at thebibleversebyverse.com, and I sure hope you do. That's thebibleversebyverse.com. Click on the book you want to study, the chapter, and study using my audio Bible messages. Remember, I am not underwritten by a large church or denomination, never have been. Depend totally on you. If you want to give, you can. Click the Donate button at the top of the front page 
at thebibleversebyverse.com. So long, everyone.